What's up guys? My name is Ryan. I spent the last few years exploring the incredible country of France and I want to share with you my favorite places. So here's my France Top 100. Of all the countries on earth, I think France tops them all when it comes to its combination of natural beauty and endless history. From the diverse landscapes of Corsica to the wild horses of the Carmagh, it's easy to see why France is the most visited country in the world. For this list, I also included places in overseas France like French Polynesia. This video is a long one, so I made timestamps so you can jump around to your favorite destinations. Let's start this video off at the French Riviera. Located in southern France on the Mediterranean Sea, the French Riviera is one of the most highly sought after destinations in Europe. One of my favorite places on the French Riviera is Ez. Located on a hilltop overlooking the coast below, I have to say this was easily one of the most impressive medieval places I visited in southern France. Ez was founded during the Middle Ages around the 14th century and today it's known worldwide for its medieval vibe and views of the French Riviera. I really enjoyed exploring the pathways that wind through the village you really feel like you're walking back in time. Everything is so old, yet it's perfectly preserved. One of the main features of Ez is its exotic garden. It's a beautiful area that sits on top of the village. It not only has beautiful plants, but it offers an incredible overlook of the French Riviera. It's definitely worth the climb and six euro entry fee. After it, we're gonna visit Monton. Located about 30 minutes from Ez, Monton is strikingly beautiful with its colorful buildings complemented with the backdrop of the Maritime Alps. Monton was a part of Italy until 1860 and then it became a part of France. Now there's a great boardwalk that walks along the coast and I enjoyed going out to the lighthouse pier to get panoramic views of Menton. Afterwards, we're gonna visit the country of Monaco. Located right between Ez and Monton, Monaco is the second smallest country in the world after the Vatican. The whole country is only 499 acres. Monaco has been known as a billionaire's playground and over one third of Monaco's citizens are millionaires. One reason why Monaco draws rich is because it's a tax haven, there are no income taxes and the other tax rates are extremely low. One of the most famous places in Monaco is the Monte Carlo Casino. It was opened in 1863 and has been featured in the James Bond films. After, we're going to visit the nearby saint jean cap ferrat Known as one of the pearls of the French Riviera, saint jean cap ferrat is an absolutely beautiful fishing village that is home to some of the most expensive real estate in the world. With its incredible scenery and proximity to places like Monaco and the sea, I can understand why it's such desired real estate. After, we're going to head over to the city of Nice. As the capital of the Maritime Alps Department of France, Nice is the largest city on the French Riviera. Now one of my favorite features of Nice is its beaches. They stretch for several kilometers all the way down the coast. Another great thing that you can do there is walk up to the Castle Hill. It offers an incredible overlook of Nice. Another incredible town on the French Riviera is Antibes. Located about 30 minutes from Nice, Antibes was originally founded as a Greek colony around the 4th century BC and a few centuries later it was incorporated into the Roman Empires and it grew to be one of the largest towns in the region. Today, Antibes is one of French Riviera's most sought after destinations. I particularly like the fort that overlooks the coast. Another prominent nearby resort town is Cannes. It's located about 20 minutes drive from Antibes. Like many places along the French Riviera, Cannes is associated with the rich and famous and hosts the annual Cannes Film Festival. Now just outside of Cannes is some of the most beautiful coastline on the French Riviera. It's called the Estorel and it's these red rock cliffs that dive into the sea. Now I was talking to a local on the beach and he told me that this was his favorite place on the Riviera so I had to go check it out. I mean I've never seen red colored cliffs in the Mediterranean. It reminded me a lot of the landscapes you find in the American Southwest. Now it's full of hidden coves, red rock islands, and secluded beaches. I love just driving along the coastline and parking in its many lookout points and just exploring the coast. I highly recommend visiting here. Now one really cool place I visited in the area is Cap du Germain. Now the reason I wanted to go here is because there's this little island with a medieval looking watchtower on it. It was constructed in the 20th century and it's believed to be the inspiration behind the black island in the adventures of Tintin. Now it just looks so scenic coupled with the red coastline. I mean there's a really nice beach there and the water is perfect for free diving. Such an enjoyable place. Now afterwards we're going to visit the town of San Tropez. Now this is one of my favorite towns I visit on the French Riviera. Saint-Tropez is located about an hour and a half drive from Nice. Now Saint-Tropez grew as a fishing village and military stronghold until the 20th century and it was the first town to be liberated on the French Riviera during World War II. 
In the 1960s, Saint-Tropez started gaining popularity amongst jet setters and today is renowned for its beaches, nightlife and yachts. Now the main part of Saint-Tropez is pretty small but I love just walking around its streets and alleyways. There was this path that walks along the coast and it was just really nice to explore. All in all, Saint-Tropez is a really beautiful town and I understand why it's so popular. Afterwards, we're going to visit the French Alps. Now this is easily one of my favorite regions in all of France. It's home to the incredibly massive Mont Blanc, which is the highest mountain in all the Alps at 4,807 meters. Mont Blanc doesn't have the most prominent peak compared to other mountains, but just hard to comprehend how huge this mountain is. Now the town located at the base of Mont Blanc is Chamonix. It's a hub for some of Europe's best skiing and hikes. I really enjoyed walking around the town. It reminded me of a French Zermatt. Now one thing you gotta do while you're there is take the gondola to L'Aiguille du Midi. Now to get there you can take a 20 minute cable car ride which holds the road record for the highest vertical ascent by a cable car with an altitude gain of over 2,807 meters. Now when you reach the top, you'll be at an elevation of 3,843 meters. You can definitely feel the shortness of oxygen in your lungs. When you get off the lift, you'll walk through this labyrinth of tunnels carved straight out of the granite. There's tons of walkways and platforms to explore. You'll get an excellent view of Mont Blanc and the other mountains. Now one thing I thought was crazy is that there's a place where the mountaineers exit to either go hike to Mont Blanc or just explore the glacier. Le Gui du Midi was such an incredible experience and definitely the highlight of our time in the French Alps. Now when you get back to Chamonix, another thing you can do is take the train to Mer de Glace. You can get a Mont Blanc multi-pass for about 83 euros. This will both let you take the train and the lift to Le Gui du Midi. Now the train winds up the mountain and you get some great views along the way. Sit on the left hand side to get the best views. Now when you reach the top, you'll be able to see the Mer de Glace. It's the second largest glacier in all of Europe. I mean, what's sad is when you look at pictures of over 150 years ago and you see how much this glacier has shrank. Regardless, the whole area is breathtaking. You'll get views of the surrounding mountains. They're just like so jagged. I've never seen anything like them. Afterwards, we're going to visit the nearby city of Anzi. Now, located at the foot of the Alps, about an hour's drive from Chamonix, this alpine town is famous for its canals, hence it's called the Venice of the Alps. Now, the city is just absolutely magical, but what I love about the region is the Lake Anzi. It's surrounded by scenic mountains, and it's known as one of the cleanest lakes in all of Europe. I mean, I can't think of a better place to enjoy on a hot summer day. One of the crowning features of the area is the Chateau de Menthon Saint Bernard. The first fortress was built here around 1,000 years ago, and today it stands as one of the most impressive castles in all the Alps. We decided to explore it. It cost about 11 euros to enter. I was just astonished by the size of it and how well the castle was preserved. There was a massive courtyard with perfectly laid stones. The chateau's interior was just as impressive. It's just wild to think people lived in such luxury hundreds of years ago. I mean, I can't imagine what it must have been like to live there back then. After it, we're gonna visit Grenoble. Located about two hours drive from Chamonix, Grenoble is the biggest metropolis in the Alps with a population around 700,000. One of my favorite features of Grenoble is the Fort de la Bastille. It's a 19th century military fort and you can take a cable car up to the top to get incredible views of Grenoble. One thing that's great about Grenoble is that it's so close to many places in the Alps. A scenic drive outside of Grenoble is Croix de la Croix de Fer. It's this incredible scenic mountain pass with hairpin turns and alpine views. It's been featured in the Tour de France over 20 times I can understand why with the area's natural beauty. A beautiful lake in the area is Lac de Serponçon. It's this beautiful reservoir with turquoise water and one thing that I particularly like about it is this little island with a church on it called San Michel that dates back to around the 17th century. I mean there's no shortage of scenic churches in France. After it, we're going to take a drive on the Col du Luteré with an altitude of 2,058 meters. Col du Luteré is the highest mountain pass in France that is accessible year round. The road features incredible views and you pass through some quaint villages like Le Grave. From the highest point in the pass, you can take a road that leads you up to Col du Galibier at an elevation of 2,642 meters. It's the 8th highest paved road in the Alps and also one of the highest routes featured in the Tour de France. While we're still on the topic of mountain passes, we're going to visit Col de Liseron. At an elevation of 2,770 meters, Col de Liseron is the highest paved mountain pass in the Alps. It's located in the Grain Alps and connects into Italy. If you head south on the pass, you'll reach Vanoise National Park, which is the first national park in France. It's home to animals such as the ibex. 
Now if you go north from the pass, you'll reach the famous ski resort, Atinya. Comprised of five alpine villages, Tinya is famous for having one of the highest skiable areas in the Alps and one of the longest ski seasons in Europe. The villages are an altitude of 2100 meters, but you can ski on the Grand Moat Glacier that has skiable terrain that reaches up to 3456 meters, and you can ski there from 10 to 11 months out of the year. While Tinya is best known for its winters, during the summertime, Tinya is an excellent place to go hiking and enjoy the Alps. Another great ski area is Avarea. It's located about a one and a half hours drive from Geneva. What I really like about Avarea is its architecture. There are these high-rise residences that are built upon the cliff. Avarea's was also designed to be fully skiable as cars are prohibited, which adds to its charm. Afterwards, we're gonna to continue to the slopes of Val Thorens. Located about a two and a half hours drive from Geneva, Val Thorens is the highest ski resort base in Europe at an elevation of 2,300 meters. It's part of the Three Valley Ski Area which is considered to be the largest ski area in the world with over 600 kilometers of ski slopes. Francis has so many incredible ski resorts. After, we're going to trade in the snow for some warm weather on the island of Corsica. Located in the Mediterranean, Corsica is easily one of Europe's most beautiful and diverse islands. One of my favorite places that I've visited there is Bonifacio. Located in the very south of Corsica, Bonifacio is one of the most unique cities I've ever been to. It's this medieval commune that's built right on these white limestone cliffs that are over 70 meters high. A lot of the limestone has eroded and some of the buildings are built on an overhang. I mean, it looks like they're going to fall straight into the sea. The Bonifacio that you see today was founded around 900 AD when the citadel was built by the Duke of Tuscany. Now today, Bonifacio is an impressive town. I really enjoyed walking around the harbor. It was full of boats and it was really nice to take a stroll on the boardwalk. Now to get to the main part of Bonifacio, it's a decent walk, but once we got there, I really enjoyed exploring the old town. I mean, you definitely feel like you're taking a stroll back in time. If you stay around for sunset, you can drive up to the nearby cliffs east of Bonifacio to get a spectacular view of the village as the sun lights it up with an orange glow and slowly descends over the horizon. Afterwards, we're going to visit the nearby St. Anthony Beach. This is probably my favorite beach in all of Corsica and one of the main reasons I wanted to come here. To get to the beach, it's about a short 10 minute drive from Bonifacio and then from there you'll make a 30 minute hike with the last part descending down to the beach. When we reached it, I was just so stoked. The massive rock that dominates the beach is so incredible. I mean, I went here twice. One day the beach was super calm and the other time it had some decent waves. The water was so warm to swim in and the clarity was amazing. While I was there, I noticed this cave in the rock. So I swam over to it to check it out. To my surprise, the cave was actually a tunnel and it connected to the other side. I felt like Indiana Jones finding a secret passageway. Anyways, we just had a great time at St. Anthony Beach. The combination of the crystal clear waters, green vegetation, and white rocks is unmatched. And I just love this place so much. After it, we're going to visit Palombagia. Now, if you enjoy calm waters and pristine beaches, Palombagia is your place. It's located on the southeastern coast, about 40 minutes from Bonifacio. Now, when you think of the Mediterranean, this is it. It's such an ideal location, home to some world class beaches. One of my favorite features of Palombagia was its distinct pine trees that line the coast. Now when we were here, we found a really nice secluded beach and spent the sunrise there. Afterwards, we went to another one called Plag de Ajaju, and it was this picturesque cove with water that was like glass and it was a perfect place to spend the early afternoon. Another nearby beach is Santa Julia. It's a scenic cove with a beach that's situated between this lake and the crystal clear Tyranian Sea. I mean, I couldn't believe the watercolor and it also had this really cool group of rocks that people were paddleboarding and swimming out to. Definitely a great beach to enjoy a nice afternoon at. Now afterwards, we're going to leave the coast to venture into Corsica's mountains. Corsica may be famous for its beaches, but it's also home to some of the most incredible mountains in Europe. One of my favorite places in Corsica's mountains was the Aiguille de Bavella. Aiguille is the French word for needles and after seeing those mountains, I totally understand why it's called that. The area is full of these jagged granite rocks that make up for some of the most beautiful mountains I've ever seen. From the village of the villa, you can walk around and marvel at the mountains. I was also fascinated by the trees up here. They were so unique looking and created for the most epic landscape combination. There is some climbing and hiking trails that you can go on that connect to the GR20, which is this insane trail that goes across Corsica's island. Next time I'm there, I definitely love to go on them and get a closer perspective of the Aguiz de Bavella. 
While we're still in the mountains, we're going to head to the north to visit the Rostonica Valley. Located about 30 minutes outside the city of Corte, the Rostonica Valley is a scenic spot dominated by mountains on both sides. I mean, I couldn't believe the scale of this place. At the top, there was a parking lot and little restaurant, and from there you can make a hike to two lakes. The first is Lac de Melo, and from there you can continue to Lac de Capitello. There are truly some incredible alpine lakes. If you do go to them, expect to take anywhere from 4 to 5 hours to make the round trip trek. Afterwards, we're going to head back to the coast to visit Le Rousse. Now, located about an hour's drive from Corte, Le Rousse is this town on the coast that was founded in 1758 to create a new port that wasn't controlled by the Genoese. Now, my favorite feature of Le Rousse is the islands that are connected to the mainland by a road. We drove out onto it and then walked around on them. There's this really cool lighthouse, but it was temporarily closed. The weather was a little gloomy while I was here, but if you come around for sunset on a clear day, it looks spectacular. Now afterwards, we're gonna to head to Corsica's capital, Ajaccio. Located on the western coast of Corsica, Ajaccio is a fascinating city full of history and surrounding beauty. During medieval times, Ajaccio was in decline until the Genoese decided to rebuild a new city towards the end of the 15th century. Today, Ajaccio is the biggest city on the island with over 90,000 inhabitants. Now, another interesting fact about Ajaccio is that it is where Napoleon Bonaparte was born in 1769. One really cool place located about 30 minutes outside of Ajaccio is the Parata Tower. It's this massive Genoese tower that offers incredible view of the nearby islands. It's a perfect place to go to watch the sunset. Afterwards, we're going to take a drive on the Calanque de Piana. Located about an hour and a half from Ajaccio, the Calanque de Piana is this incredible area on the coast home to distinct red cliffs and rock formations. There's this incredibly picturesque road that winds through the rocks, and it's a little tight at times, but 100% worth the drive. I enjoyed walking around and marveling at the views. I mean, the rocks were so unique and beautiful there. If you continue driving on the road, you'll reach the town of Porto. The main reason I wanted to go here was to visit the Genoese Tower. I mean, it looks so epic with the waves slamming into the rock with the mountains in the back. After it, we're gonna experience Torre di Turku. There's no shortage of medieval watchtowers in Corsica, and this is possibly one of my favorites. To reach it, it's a long hike, but 100% worth it. The hike starts off with a nice descent, but as you approach the tower, it's a decent scramble up the Rocky Mountain. When we reached the tower, I was just impressed by how big it was, and just the fact that they were able to build this back in medieval times. There was a windy stair on the outside, and then another stairway inside to reach the top. I mean, the views up there were spectacular. It was a 360 panorama, perfect for spotting incoming pirates and enemies back in the day. I mean, we spent the sunset up there, and it was the perfect way to end our time on this magnificent island. After, we're going to head back to France's mainland to visit the region of Brittany. Located at the northwestern tip of France, Brittany is a land full of rugged beaches and countless lighthouses. One of the most well-known places in Brittany is St. Malo. When it comes to walled cities, St. Malo may be one of the most impressive I've ever seen. It was found back in the 1st century BC by the Gauls, and it prospered throughout the centuries thanks to its strategic position. It became famous for being home to the Corsairs, who were basically pirates for the French government. Fast forward to 1940, and St. Malo was invaded by the Nazis, and in 1944, St. Malo was almost entirely destroyed by the Allies. It took 12 years to rebuild St. Malo. Today, it stands as one of the most incredible port cities I've ever been to, I mean, I couldn't believe the giant walls that surrounded the city. I also love the beaches of St. Malo. There were these natural pools that filled with seawater, and they had some platforms to jump into the sea. I mean, what a historic and beautiful area. Now, right across the bay from St. Malo is the town of Dinard. It's an equally beautiful area with pristine beaches coupled with these immaculate houses. There was also this other ocean swimming pool that looks so fun to swim in. After it, we're going to head to the interior of Brittany to visit the similarly named city called Dinan. Located about 30 minutes from St. Malo, Dinan is this charming medieval town. My favorite areas in the city is the Port of Dinan. It's located right in the river and it's full of quaint buildings and I love the boats passing by. After it, we're going to head back to Brittany's coast to visit Plumanac. Located about a two hours drive from St. Malo, Plumanac is this incredibly scenic port town. My favorite feature of the area is its coast. It's made up of a very unique pink granite. There's a striking lighthouse called Farde Menrus built upon the rocks, and the whole area is just stunning. There's a lot of walking trails, and I definitely recommend waiting around for the sunset. While we're still on the topic of lighthouses, we're going to visit Le Far du Petit Menu. It's located near the town of Plouzan, and it's this 19th century lighthouse that has an arched walkway to get out to it. I mean, I just like how there's like two of them. Such a unique little place. After it, we're going to head south on the coast to visit Far de Ecmule. 
Located at the port of St. Pierre, Friday Egg Mule was constructed in 1897 and is currently one of the tallest lighthouses in France and the world with a height of 65 meters. I really love the town that surrounds the lighthouse and you can also see the two earlier lighthouses in front of it. You can climb over 300 steps to reach the top of the lighthouse for an incredible view of the area. Afterwards, we're going to head back to southern France to visit Marseille. Located about a two hours drive from Nice, Marseille is an incredible city on the Mediterranean. Marseille was founded all the way back in 600 BC by Greek settlers, making it the oldest city in France and one of Europe's oldest continuously inhabited settlements. Today, Marseille is the second largest city in France. Now, the crowning feature of Marseille is the Basilic Notre Dame de la Garde. It sits on Marseille's highest point overlooking the city. I love the contrast between the white rock and the greenish gray sandstone. Another one of my favorite features of Marseille is its old port. The Fort Saint John overlooks the entrance, and it's just so cool to watch the ships go in and out. Just 40 minutes from Marseille is the idyllic town of Cassis. Now I think this was my favorite place we visited in southern France. We stayed several days here, I'm just so glad we did. It's a seaside town with that classic French cheek charm. Now Cassis is overlooked by Cap Canai, which is home to the highest sea cliffs in all of France with a height of 394 meters. Now there's a great beach in Cassis, overlooked by a castle. I mean, I just love walking around the harbor, looking at all the boats. You can also walk to the lighthouse at the end of the harbor to just relax and enjoy the sounds of the sea. Now one of the main reasons I wanted to go to Cassis and just southern France in general was to visit the Quelanques. Now they are these incredible sea coves surrounded by daunting cliffs and crystal clear waters. The one I really wanted to go to is Calanc d'Anvu. Now there's several ways to get here. You can either take a boat, kayak, or hike in. Now on our first day there, we rented a little boat from the harbor in Cassis and headed out to the Calanques. Now the views on the way were just absolutely incredible. Now one downside about the boat is we couldn't land on the beach. You can only drive like halfway through and then it's roped off. But if you do rent a kayak or a paddleboard, you can take it to the beach which I definitely recommend if you can handle the long paddle. Now we went in as far as we could in the Kalunk and then turned around after we just kept exploring the coastline, heading west as we relaxed in this other Kalunk with some just really unique cliffs and rock formations. It was such a phenomenal area. Now the next day I really wanted to go to the beach in the Kalunk Denvu, so we decided to do a hike now the hike was about seven kilometers long and it had this one steep descent to get down to the beach. Nothing you can't handle. Now once we reached the beach, I mean it was really an amazing sight. The steep white cliffs coupled with the greens of the pines and blues of the water were just amazing. Now the beach was a decent size with a lot of smooth pebbles. We went for a swim and the water was just so freaking clear. I wanted to find a cliff jump spot, so after swimming down the cove, I found this rock about 7 meters high and did a few jumps off of it. I mean, there's truly no better feeling than cliff jumping into the Mediterranean. Now afterwards, we're going to head over to the island of Porquerolle. It's part of the Yer Islands Archipelago, and the village on the island was founded back in 1820. Today, most of the island remains undeveloped as it's protected and it's a perfect nature getaway with some of France's best beaches. Now you can reach the island by taking a 15 minute shuttle boat from the Guyenne's Peninsula or you can also reach it from Toulon. Now while you're there you can bike or hike around the island to its Caribbean like beaches such as Cortad Beach or you can trek around to its more rugged parts of the island. It's definitely an island worth visiting. After we're going to head over to the Verdun Gorge. Located about a two and a half hours drive from Marseille, the Verdun Gorge is one of the most impressive canyons in France. One of my favorite places in the gorge is the view from Ponte Galetes. You get a view of the dramatic cliffs contrasted with the blue water. While you're there, you can rent a boat or paddleboard and explore the gorge. You can also drive above it and get some phenomenal views. Right by the Verdun Gorge is the town of Moustier, considered to be one of the most beautiful towns in France. Moustier is this incredible commune situated right below these rocky cliffs. The history of Moustier dates back to the 5th century and today about 700 residents live there. There is this star that hangs between the cliffs overlooking the city. There are many legends regarding it. Most believe it was put there by night in the 12th century to pay tribute to the Virgin Mary after he returned alive from a crusade. Afterwards, we're going to visit the nearby lavender fields of Valensole. Located about 40 minutes from the Verdun Gorge, Valensole is situated on this plateau and it's one of the best places in France to see the endless rows of lavender. The best time to see the lavender fields is from late June to early July when they are full bloom. I mean, it just smells so incredible there, just seeing all the bees around. It's such a magical place. 
After, we're going to visit the unique landscapes of Provincial, Colorado. Located about two hours from Marseille, near the town of Rousseau, the Provincial, Colorado is home to landscapes I would expect to find in the American Southwest. The Colorado is famous for its ochre-colored clay and rock formations. There are trails that go through the area, and you can expect to spend an hour or two wandering through this unique place. There's also another nearby hiking area called Les Centiores des Orques. It's located about 30 minutes from Roustrel, and it's this pass situated right by the town of Rosillon. There's two trails, a long one and a short one, and it takes anywhere from 30 minutes to an hour to complete. I mean, the area is full of so much color with the red and orange ochre contrasted with the green pines. If you're in Provence, this area is worth checking out. After, we're going to visit the historic city of Arles. Located on the Rhone River about an hour from Marseille, Arles is an incredible historic city. It began as an important trading port for the Phoenicians, and it was taken by the Romans in the year 123 BC. Arles reached its peak during the 4th and 5th centuries as Roman empires used the city as their headquarters during military campaigns throughout Europe. Arles continued to prosper in the late Roman Empire and was a renowned culture and religious center. One of my favorite features of the city of Arles is its amphitheater. It was built in 90 AD and could hold up to 20,000 spectators. After the fall of the Roman Empire, the amphitheater was converted into a miniature town of its own with 200 houses inside. Today, the houses have been removed and the amphitheater has been restored to its former glory. After it, we're going to visit Igmort. Located about an hour from Arles, Igmort translates to dead or stagnant waters due to the ponds and marshes around the town that have non-drinkable water. Now, the area has been used to mine salt since ancient times, making it a very important place as salt was basically worth its weight in gold back then. Today, the medieval wall surrounding Igmort stands perfectly preserved and the city is considered to be one of the best examples of 13th century military architecture. Another feature I love about the medieval town is the pink salt ponds around the city walls and this place is so fascinating. Now afterwards, we're going to visit the Camargue. Located in Western Europe's largest river delta, Camargue is this incredible marsh and coastal region full of some of France's best wildlife and flora. The most iconic animal in Camargue is its horses. They are considered to be one of the oldest horse breeds in the world and it's believed they have been roving these marshes for thousands of years. Seeing the horses run free on Camargue's beaches is one of the most idyllic sights in the world. They are truly some of Europe's most majestic animals. Camargue is also famous for its black bulls and there's also a large population of pink flamingos. There's some incredible wildlife here. After it, we're going to continue heading up the Rhone River and visit Avignon. Located about 50 minutes from Arles, Avignon was where seven popes resided from the years 1309 to 1377 instead of Rome. The Palais de Pape is where the popes resided and it's considered to be one of the largest and most important medieval gothic buildings in Europe. One of my favorite features of Avignon is its bridge. It was originally a wooden bridge built during the 12th century, but it was destroyed by a crusade and it was later rebuilt with 22 arches, but today only four remain due to the river flooding and causing the arches to collapse. Now, if you want to escape the city and visit one of France's most accessible mountain peaks, you can drive up to Mont Ventoux. Located about an hour's drive from Avignon, Mont Ventoux is the tallest mountain in the province with a height of 1,910 meters. The mountain is a popular place for cyclists to test their endurance, and it's also been part of the Tour de France as cyclists race to the top. After it, we're going to visit the Ardèche Gorge. Located about an hour and a half from Avignon, the Ardèche Gorge is one of the most beautiful natural areas in France. One of my favorite features of the area is the Pont d'Arc. It's this massive stone arch that stretches over the river and it's a great place to kayak and swim during the summer months. After we're going to visit Nîmes. Known as being the most Roman city outside of Italy, Nîmes has been referred to as the French Rome. Back in the first century BC, it became a Roman colony and Julius Caesar started a building program to protect and grow the city. Nîmes prospered until the end of the third century and it was eventually overtaken by the Visigoths in 472. My favorite Roman structure that remains today is the Arena of Nîmes. It's considered to be one of the best preserved Roman amphitheaters and it's the biggest one in France. Another incredible feat of Roman architecture nearby is the Pont du Gard. It's located about 30 minutes outside of Nîmes and it's the tallest Roman aqueduct bridge ever built with a height of 48.8 meters. It was completed sometime in the 1st century AD and is believed to have taken around 15 years to complete. It's just mind-boggling that the Romans were able to construct this nearly 2,000 years ago. The bridge helped carry water 50 kilometers to Nîmes. It's truly one of the greatest preserved pieces of Roman architecture that exists today. After it, we're going to visit the modern architectural wonder of Miu Viaduct. Located about a two hours drive from Nîmes, the Miu Viaduct is the tallest bridge in the world with a height of 336 meters. 
It was completed in 2004 after costing about 400 million euros and is considered to be one of the greatest engineering achievements of modern times. I mean, the scale of this bridge is on another level. I mean, I don't know what's more impressive, the Miu Viaduct or the Pont du Gard, both are architectural marvels. After, we're going to visit Montpellier. Located about 15 minutes from Nîmes, Montpellier is the third largest French city on the Mediterranean. During medieval times, it was part of the Spanish Kingdom of Aragon, but it was sold to France in 1349. One thing that I thought was interesting about Montpellier is that it's home to the oldest medical school that's still in operation. It was founded back in 1220 and has taught notable alumni such as Nostradamus. If I decided to be a doctor, I would have loved to study there. Today, Montpellier is one of France's fastest growing cities. One of my favorite features of Montpellier is its 18th century aqueduct that supplied water from 14 kilometers away. From Montpellier, you can make the 20 minute drive to the coast to visit Pavelas Les Flots. Located on this narrow strip of land between these ponds and the Mediterranean, Pavelas Les Flots is a nice beach area, perfect for a weekend escape. It originated as a fishing village, and today it's one of the best beach towns in the area. There are over 7 kilometers of beaches, and I particularly like the uniquely shaped harbor full of boats. After it, let's head over to the medieval fortress of Carcassonne. When I imagine medieval Europe, I don't think there's a place that exemplifies it better than the fortified city of Carcassonne. Located about two hours from Montpellier, Carcassonne became a popular spot in 100 BC when the Romans identified this strategic location and decided to build a fortification on the hilltop. Throughout the centuries, Carcassonne proved to be an impregnable fortress as army after army failed to overtake the protected city. Today, Carcassonne consists of 53 towers that are protected by its two outer walls. It remains as one of Europe's greatest medieval gems. What an incredible piece of history. After it, we're going to head to one of my favorite bridges in France, Pont Volontre. Located in the town of Cahors, Pont Volontre is a medieval bridge that spans over the Lailat River. It took 70 years to construct the bridge and it was finally finished in 1378. Today, the bridge features six arches with three towers and can only be crossed by foot. After it, we're going to head back to the Mediterranean to visit Culior. Located on the sea near the border of Spain, Culior is an incredibly scenic harbor town. Now, one of my favorite features of Culior is the Fort St. Elm. It was opened in 1552 and it's a star-shaped fortress. I also like the beaches in the town. They are contrasted with medieval buildings and it's such a peaceful place. After, we're going to head to the mountains to visit the Pyrenees. Straddling both France and Spain, the Pyrenees are a mountain range that separates the Iberian Peninsula with the rest of Europe. One of the most impressive places in the Pyrenees is the Cirque de Gavernie. It's this massive horseshoe-shaped glacier bowl with numerous waterfalls descending its cliffs. It was described by Victor Hugo as the Colosseum of Nature. The second tallest waterfall in Europe is found here with a height of 422 meters. It's a little bit of a hike to reach the Cirque, but 100% worth it. A beautiful lake in the area is Lac de Gab. You can take up some cable cars, and after that it's a short 15 minute walk to this spectacular lake. Another one of my favorite places in the Pyrenees is Lac de Ayou. It's a nice two hour hike to the lake and has an incredible view of the mountains. It's an excellent place to visit for sunrise or sunset. After we're going to head to France's west coast to visit Biarritz. Located on the Atlantic Ocean near the border of Spain, Biarritz is a luxury travel destination famous for its incredible coastline and surfing. Compared to places on the Mediterranean, the ocean of Biarritz is a stark contrast with its waves battering its beaches. The Grand Plage is a nice beach lined with some of Biarritz's noble hotels. I also like the Rocher de la Vierge. There's a walkway that takes you over the ocean to this really cool rock. Another beautiful city just south on the coast is saint jean de luz It shares its massive horror with the city of Cibor. The area not only is extremely beautiful, but it's where Louis XIV married Maria Theresa. It's considered to be one of the most important political marriages in history. Today, it's an amazing port city in France's Basque country. After, we're going to head up north to visit the wine capital of the world, Bordeaux. Located in southwestern France, Bordeaux was one of France's most incredible cities. In the 18th century, Bordeaux's Port of the Moon supplied a majority of commodities such as coffee, cocoa, and sugar to Europe, and it was one of the second busiest ports in the world after London. Going into the 19th century, Bordeaux struggled after the slave revolt in Haiti, which collapsed Bordeaux's port economy. Now today, Bordeaux is known for being the wine capital of the world. Vineyards were introduced to the region during Roman times, and wine has been made here ever since. Now a beautiful village located in Bordeaux's wine region is saint Emilion. It's located about 40 minutes outside of Bordeaux. It's this incredibly scenic medieval commune that's surrounded by vineyards that have been there since the second century. The area is incredibly picturesque and the vineyards stretch as far as the eye can see. I mean, it's such a quaint and beautiful area. 
After it, we're going to visit Dune du Pilat. Located about an hour outside Bordeaux, Dune du Pilat is the tallest sand dune in Europe with a height of 106 meters and it stretches 2.7 kilometers along the Atlantic Ocean. It's definitely a workout to climb to the top of the sand dune, but there is a staircase on the northern side to ease the climb. The scale of the Dune du Pilat is just absurd and it's such a peculiar place. Afterwards, we're going to head north on the coast to Lacanou. It's this isolated beach town with basically nothing around. There's empty beaches that stretch for miles in both directions. I mean, it makes you feel like you're at the end of the world or something. The area is known for its waves and surfing, and it totally reminded me of the beaches of California. If you want a nice beach escape, you gotta give Lacanou a visit. After, we're gonna continue up the coast to visit La Rochelle. Situated on the Bay of Biscay, La Rochelle is a beautiful city that was founded during the 10th century. My favorite feature of La Rochelle is its harbor. It's guarded by these two medieval towers that overlook the port. From La Rochelle, you can make the short drive to the neighboring island of Ile de Ré. There's a bridge over the sea that you cross to get to the island. Ile de Ré is a quaint place and it's a popular destination to escape and relax. I really like the town of St. Martin with its fortified port. The little island is also a great place to go surfing. After it, we're going to visit the region of Dordogne. Located in central France, Dordogne is a rural area full of incredible towns, villages, and history. Dordogne is known as the land of 1,001 castles because, in fact, there are 1,001 castles. Now, one of my favorite features is the Chateau de Bénac. It was built in the 12th century by the Barons of Bénac, and today it's one of the best reserved castles in the region. I just love how it's perched on the cliff overlooking the town below. Now, afterwards, we're going to visit Rocamador. It's located in southern France on the river Dordogne. Now I think Rocamadour is one of the coolest cliffside towns in all of France. It dates back to medieval times with its earliest records dating back to the 1200s and it's attracted pilgrims throughout the centuries and today it's regarded as one of France's most beautiful towns. I love when they bring hot air balloons here I and mean, it's so incredibly enchanting. Afterwards we're going to visit this church called Saint-Michel d'Aigui. It's located in the town of Le Poy. The church is built on this needle-like rock that's 82 meters high. The church was built in 1969 and is dedicated to the Archangel Michael. You can walk up 268 steps to reach the top. I mean, once again, the churches of France will never cease to amaze me. Now, afterwards, we're going to visit the city of Lyon. Located about an hour and a half from Grenoble, Lyon is a beautiful city built upon two converging rivers. During Roman times, Lyon was the capital of the Gauls, and during the Renaissance, Lyon was a major economic hub. Today, it's France's third largest city. One of the most prominent features of Lyon is the Basilica of Notre Dame. It's perched perfectly on the hill overlooking the city. After, we're going to head over to the Alsace region. Located in eastern France, bordering Germany and Switzerland, the Alsace region is famous for its medieval cities, wine country, and rich history. Over the centuries, the region has alternated between French and German control, and today it represents a mix of those cultures. The capital of the Alsace region is Strasbourg. It's home to the formal seat of the European Parliament. Another enchanting city in the region is Colmar. It's located just an hour's drive from Strasbourg. Now Colmar looks like something straight out of a Disney film. The city's old town is lined with timber, medieval buildings. I also love the canal that runs through the city. It just adds to the magic of the place. If you want to escape the cities, you can experience the Alsace wine route. It's a 170 kilometer long route that passes through some of France's greatest wine country and picturesque towns. One of my favorites is the quaint village of Riquivier. It's believed to be the village that inspired the town from Beauty and the Beast. Another noble nearby village is Kaiserberg. It dates back to the 1200s and it has switched being part of both Germany and France several times throughout the centuries. One of my favorite features of Kaiserberg is its castle. It was built about 800 years ago and overlooks the village. Another incredible castle in the region is the Chateau du Haut Königsberg. Perched upon a mountain overlooking the Black Forest, this castle dates back to the 12th century and it was rebuilt by the last German Emperor in the early 1900s. After World War I, it became part of France and today it's one of the most visited attractions in the region. Another entering place in Alsace is Neuf Brissac. It's this octagon shaped town that began in 1698 with the intent to guard the border between France, Germany and the Holy Roman Empire. When it comes to fortresses, this is one of the most perfect ones I've ever seen. Afterwards, we're going to head to northern France to visit Dunkirk. Located right on the coast near the Belgian border, Dunkirk is a famous World War II location. On May 10, 1940, Germany invaded Belgium, Luxembourg, the Netherlands, and France. As a result, the Allied troops found themselves trapped on the beaches of Dunkirk. 
Now, from May 26 to June 4th, the greatest military evacuation in history took place as 330,000 Allied troops were evacuated to England across the English Channel. Winston Churchill called the evacuation a miracle of deliverance. And it's just wild to think all the miracles that took place during World War II. Today, Dunkirk is a peaceful area. It's crazy to think what happened here nearly 80 years ago. After it, we're going to head west on the coast to visit Cap Blanet. Located about 45 minutes from Dunkirk, Cap Blanet is this incredible coastal area with striking white cliffs that are 134 meters high. It's basically the closest point of France to the UK's mainland at just 34 kilometers away. Now just across the English Channel is the cliffs of Dover and Cap Blanet looks very similar. On top of Cap Blanet is a nice memorial I and mean, if you're in the area, it's a great place to explore. After it, we're going to leave mainland France and head over to the South Pacific to visit the islands of French Polynesia. Now when you think of tropical paradise, this is it. Pristine beaches, lush mountains, and the clearest water you've ever seen. Now when you come to French Polynesia, you're first flying to Tahiti. It's the biggest island in the country and I was just amazed by its size and its jagged mountains. One place I really wanted to see on Tahiti was Tiopu. It's this little town located about a two hours drive from the airport. Now, Tiopu is home to one of the world's best surf waves. The combination of the swell and the uniquely shaped reef creates what some believe to be the heaviest wave on earth that can reach over seven meters high. One thing that I thought was interesting about Tiopu is that it's scheduled to host the surfing competition for the 2024 Paris Summer Olympics. Now, the wave was first surfed in 1985 by local Tahitians and over the years it has become known worldwide for having one of the most consistent barrel waves. Now I drove to this little parking lot in Tiopu and I could see the wave from the shore, but I think the best way to experience the wave besides surfing it is by going on a boat tour. I wish I would have planned ahead better and booked one, but if you do go on a tour, you'll be able to get up close and personal with the real famous wave. Now after Tahiti, we're gonna head over to the neighboring island of Morea. Known as the Pearl of the Sea, Morea is one of the most beautiful places I've ever been. Now to reach Morea, we took a ferry from Tahiti. Once you arrive on the island, there's just so much to do here. I think Morea is home to some of the most spectacular mountains. They're just so jagged and unique looking. My favorite one was called Mount Mo'aroa, which translates to the shark's tooth. It rises 880 meters above the sea, and I totally get where it gets its name with its sharp, rigid appearance. Another one of my favorite peaks was Mount Rotui. You can get a great view of it from the Belvedere Lookout, which is just a quick drive to reach. Now, if you're more into beaches, one of my favorite ones was the public beach, Ta'a Hiamanu. It's this really relaxing beach with sailboats and amazing scenery all around. It's a prime place to watch the sunset. Another great thing you can do on Morea is go on a boat tour. We went on a tour and unfortunately it was really rainy but it still was a great experience. We swam with black tip sharks and we went outside the reef and swam in the deep ocean. I mean I couldn't believe how warm the water was. Now if you go here from August to November you can swim with humpback whales. I definitely want to go back during that time to swim with those gentle giants. After it, we're going to visit the island of Bora Bora. Of all the islands in French Polynesia, Bora Bora is probably the most famous and after visiting it, I totally understand why. Now the geology of Bora Bora is pure perfection. There's the main island with its towering dormant volcano and then it's surrounded by this reef that protects the island from the waves of the Pacific Ocean. Inside the reef, there's a lagoon which is home to some of the world's clearest water and is full of wildlife such as sharks and rays. I mean seriously, Bora Bora couldn't be more perfect. Now to reach Bora Bora, we flew into Tahiti and then from there we took a short 50 minute flight and landed on Bora Bora. The airport here is on a motu which is a little island on the reef. So to get to the mainland or the resorts, you'll take a ferry. We were staying on the mainland so we hopped on the ferry and then we made the quick 15 minute boat ride to Vaitape. It was a pretty surreal ride as we approached the island and we got on top of the ferry and the views were just incredible as we got closer to Vaitape. There was even a full moon and it almost looked fake with how perfect everything was. Now while we were here, we wanted to see Bora Bora from the ocean's perspective so we decided to spend a few nights on a sailboat. We were able to go to different places in Bora Bora's lagoon and it really was magical. My favorite place we sailed to was in Bora Bora's southwest lagoon. I've been wanting to come here for a while now because there's this sandbar in the water that creates this perfect curve and the contrast between the blues of the shallow and deep water is just absolutely mesmerizing. There's definitely no shortage of shades of blue in Bora Bora and French Polynesia in general. Now while we were here, we had to go do some snorkeling, so we hopped on our dinghy with our captain Francesco, and he took us to the spot to go diving. 
We first found this eagle ray that was just flying through the current. It was so peaceful to watch. We then went over to this more shallow area and there was at least 10 sharks. Now they're black tip sharks and they're about one to two meters in length and they're basically harmless to swim with. Just very curious little animals. I mean, the water was some of the clearest I've ever been in and there's also tons of color fish just swimming around us. It's the Bora Bora that I was hoping to experience. Later that evening, we got back to our boat and had one of the most beautiful sunsets as the sun descended over the mainland. I just can't believe the beauty of these incredible islands. While we're still in the South Pacific, we're going to visit the Isle of Pines, located just off of New Caledonia. The Isle of Pines is this really peculiar island. I mean, when I imagine a tropical paradise, I certainly don't think of pine trees, but the Isle of Pines sure is an exception. To reach the island, you can come by plane or ferry. Now while you're there, you can explore the crystal clear lagoons accompanied with white sand and endless pine trees. I mean, just such a unique and beautiful little island. After, we're gonna venture to Africa to visit the island of Réunion, located in the Indian Ocean off of Madagascar. Réunion is a volcanic island that totally reminds me of Hawaii. One of the most striking features of the island is the volcano called Piton de la Fornaz. It's currently one of the most active volcanoes in the world with its most recent eruption in 2020. Réunion just has some of the most insane scenery. Afterwards, we're gonna venture to the Caribbean to visit the island of Martinique. Located between the islands of Dominica and St. Lucia, Martinique is an ideal Caribbean paradise. It has everything from historical towns to beaches perfect for surfing. The highest point on the island is Mount Pele with an elevation of 1,397 meters. Right below the volcano is this town of St. Pierre. It was founded back in 1635 and was known as the Paris of the Caribbean. In 1902, Mount Pele erupted and the whole town was sadly destroyed. Thankfully today, it's been restored and I just love the backdrop it has with the coast and Mount Pele. While we're still in the Caribbean, we're gonna visit Guadeloupe. It's a set of 12 islands and it's home to some of the most incredible scenery. One of my favorite features of the island is the Carbet Falls. It's a series of waterfalls with its highest drop being 150 meters. Another incredible place is Terre de Hau. It's this little commune that you can reach by ferry from the neighboring island. Once you reach it, there's this fortification called Fort Napoleon and it was built in the 18th century and the views of the bay you get up there are just phenomenal. After, we're gonna return to France's mainland to visit the iconic capital, Paris. Since the 17th century, Paris has been Europe's major center of finance, diplomacy, fashion, and the arts. Paris is Europe's most visited city, and with all its attractions and fascinating history, it's easy to see why. Paris's most recognizable attraction is the Eiffel Tower. Built in 1889, the Eiffel Tower is 324 meters high, which made it the tallest man-made structure in the world until 1930. Another popular attraction is the Louvre Museum. It's the world's largest art museum, and it's home to Da Vinci's Mona Lisa. You can also take a drive around the Arc de Triomphe or walk the grounds of the Palace of Versailles. There's so much to do in this grand city. After, we're gonna visit the Loire Valley. Now, located in central France, about a two hours drive from Paris, this has to be the chateau capital of the world. It's home to over 300 French castles. Now, if you're wondering why there are so many chateaus here, it's because of the combination of location, fertile grounds, and the competition amongst kings and royals that brought so many castles here. One of the most famous chateaus is Chambord. It's the largest in the valley, and its estate is as big as Paris. It's rumored that Leonardo da Vinci helped design it. It took over 28 years to build and was finished in 15. 47. I mean, it's truly a mind-blowing piece of architecture. Now, another one of my favorites is the Chateau de Chunansu. Built in the early 16th century, what's wild about this chateau is it's built upon a river. I mean, I love all the arches. It's definitely one of the most beautiful buildings in all of France. After it, we're going to head to the region of Normandy. Famous for its natural beauty and history, Normandy is one of the most well-known regions in all of France. One of my favorite places in Normandy is Etretat. Located about a three hours drive from Paris, this was one of the first places I went to when I got to France. The main reason I wanted to come here was to witness impressive sea cliffs. When we reached Etretat, we walked through the beautiful coastal town and reached the beach. It offered great views of the cliffs I and mean, I couldn't believe how big they were. After, we decided to go on top of the cliffs. We walked along the beautiful boardwalk and made it to the top. My favorite feature of the cliffs are these sea arches. There are three of them and I also like the pointed sea stack called the Agui de Etretat. After a bit, sea fog started to roll in and it gave the area such a different vibe. You can also hike above the cliffs on the eastern side of Etretat. There's a church up there and the views are incredible. If you can, I recommend staying until sunset. The sun will hit the cliffs of Etretat perfectly, lighting them up with an orange glow. It's hard to match the scenery of this coastal town. 
Afterwards, we're going to visit the charming town of Anfleur. Located about 50 minutes from Etretat, Anfleur looks like a town straight out of a Mary Poppins film. The highlight of Anfleur is its old port. It's lined with these colorful townhouses that were built from the 16th to 18th centuries. I really enjoyed walking around the town. The port was so cool with the contrast of the ships against the beautiful townhouses. I loved when it got darker and Anfleur was lit up with its lights, giving it a magical vibe. If you're in Normandy, you gotta give this enchanting town a visit. Afterwards, we're going to head over to Normandy's D-Day beaches. During World War II, the Nazis were in control of Europe's western coast, stretching from Spain's border all the way up to Norway, and this was called the Atlantic Wall. On June 6, 1944, the Allied forces landed on Normandy's beaches to break through the Nazis' Atlantic Wall. It is the largest seaborne invasion in history and led to the liberation of France and Europe. There was five beaches that the Allies invaded on June 6. One of the most famous is Omaha Beach. It's an 8 km section of coast and it was the most heavily defended beach and resulted in the most casualties. To date the beach is a beautiful and serene place I and mean, it's crazy to imagine what happened here nearly 80 years ago. There's this monument and metal sculpture called Le Brave that's built on the beach. While I was there the ocean was up to the sculpture but during low tide you can walk pretty far out on the beach. Afterwards we're going to visit the Normandy American Cemetery. It's located on the hills above Omaha Beach and it's a really solemn and sacred place. It was dedicated in 1956 to honor the American troops who died in Europe during World War II. There are 9,388 white marble graves and each one had their name, military rank, and when they passed away. I was just crazy to see how perfectly placed each grave was in every direction. It was humbling to walk around these sacred grounds and reflect on the sacrifice and bravery of these American heroes. Afterwards, we're going to visit Pont du Hoc. Located about 15 minutes from Omaha Beach, Pont du Hoc was a strategic promontory for the Nazis. It's situated on a cliff 35 meters high and it was heavily fortified with bunkers and artillery. Before D-Day, it was attacked by the US and Royal Air Forces and today you can see the numerous craters left behind. On June 6, it was attacked and captured by the Allies. The troops had to use these 30 meter rope ladders to scale the sea cliffs. It was really interesting to walk around Pont de Huck and see all the craters. It was also really fascinating to walk inside the bunkers as well and to think that there were soldiers in here almost 80 years ago. Afterwards, we're going to visit Utah Beach. Now this is the westernmost of the D-Day beaches and it was invaded by US soldiers with the objective to secure the beachhead on the Cotentin Peninsula. I really enjoyed this area and beach. I loved how there wasn't much on the coast besides grass, sand, and a few remaining bunkers. There was also a good amount of people being pulled around by horses in these little carriages which I thought was pretty cool. In the distance, I also saw a sunken ship from World War II that was pretty fascinating. I really enjoyed walking along the beach and exploring some of the bunkers. There was also a nice memorial and museum on the eastern side of the beach worth visiting. Afterwards, we're going to visit one of my favorite places in Normandy, Plage de Calgran, located on the western tip of the Cotentin Peninsula. I was amazed by the beauty of this place. The beach has these really nice cobblestone rocks, but when the tide goes out, there's some really nice sand to walk on and also some fascinating rock formations. We walked over to this overlook and the views were amazing. I mean, I couldn't believe the sea cliffs there. They were so high and it looked incredible with all the colors. After we had a great time enjoying the beach and waiting for the sunset, I mean, there's no greater feeling than running free by the ocean. Also in the area is the sea village of Guri. It's located just north of the beach and there's this lighthouse very similar to the Gaddaville one, except that this lighthouse is isolated on a small rock island. For our final destination, we're going to visit Mont Saint Michel. I have to say this is my favorite place in Normandy and France. This place is truly magical. Now to get to Mont Saint Michel, you can't drive directly to the tidal island. Instead, you can park in the lots outside and either take a shuttle or walk about 4 kilometers to Mont Saint Michel. I definitely recommend walking if you can. As you approach the island, it's quite the experience. It made me think how people must have felt throughout the ages as they came here. When you reach the island and walk through the gates, you feel like you're taking a stroll into a Harry Potter movie. I felt like I was walking down Diagon Alley. Now the crowning feature of Mont Saint Michel is its abbey. Its construction began in the 10th century and it was added onto throughout the ages. We took a tour of the abbey and it was one of the coolest buildings I've ever experienced. I mean, I felt like I was walking through a real life Hogwarts. It costs about 11 euros a person and it can take anywhere from 20 minutes to an hour to walk through the whole abbey. There's several lookout points that give you incredible views and vantage points of Mont Saint Michel's Bay. After we went back inside the abbey and I couldn't believe how beautiful it was. I mean, everything was so grand and huge. There's like all these like stone arches. The architecture here is just mind boggling. 
After exploring the abbey, I enjoyed walking above the city walls, giving us a new perspective of Mont Saint Michel's main street. Now, afterwards, the sun began to set and the tide started to come in. I was amazed by how fast the water levels were rising. I understand now why it was so dangerous for the medieval pilgrims to walk to the island. On our way back, we met up with some sheep in the fields, and it truly was a special experience and one of my favorite memories from our time in Normandy. Well, that is it for my France Top 100. There's still so many places I didn't include in this video, so one day I'll have to make a part two. Let me know where your favorite place is in France in the comments below. You can find me on Instagram and TikTok at Shirley.Films. It's Ryan, and we will see you later.